Hello, everyone. Afternoon. And uh, I see we've got um, lots of people have joined. We're still waiting for some more, uh, some of our panelists, but I think we're going to get started. Hi, Jay. Good, good to see you. And um, Alex, uh, one of our panelists, I um, I don't think our other panelists, oh, Lucky is here, welcome, great to see you. Okay, I'm going to kick off uh, because we've got a couple of, uh, about five minutes or so of introduction, so I think by the time we, we've done that, everybody will be here. So my name is Peter Wolpe, I'm working independently in the uh, uh, um, energy and climate space, and I'm part of the team um, with the tips and the lady and groundwork that are working on this project that's brought our, our, this, this public event together. One of the, the, one of the um, deliverables on the project, but uh, Gaylor will be talking about that in a, in a minute. Um, I'm going to facilitate today this webinar, which is called People's Voices, Key Priorities and Challenges for a Just Transition in Emelan Schleny and Steve Chwete. Um, we, we, I, I, I've been thinking about, you know, what do we mean by a just transition? It's, it means different things for different people, for different sectors. And we, we kind of assume a consensus, but I'm not sure there is a consensus, and, or maybe it exists at quite a sort of general and high level. Um, we know we've got to move from, um, from coal and fossil fuels and the coal industries because of the climate, because of climate change and our, our future generations. But, in, uh, that, that's a, a, a quite a long project. Uh, it has been a long project. There's some urgencies, but but there are perhaps more immediate and pressing imperatives which relate to dire poverty and health issues, and particularly in the region that our um, project is uh, focusing on, which is um, Steve Tretti and Emmeline Schleni in Mpumalanga. So there are individual and um, sp stakeholder specific drivers. And um, I, I guess there's what, what do we, we as individuals want for us or for our sector? And then what is the greater good for the community, for the country? And I, I, I was thinking a bit about the history of transformation in our country, which has um, maybe not always be smooth, there are still um, big challenges, but some of the, the, the good elements were born out of uh, communication engagement. And I, I think what, what's important for us in this project is, uh, and as the title of the talk is People's Voices, is about really hearing and listening to everybody's voice, and particularly those voices that have perhaps largely been silent um, in, 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 in the, some of the discussions. And we're very excited today that with the help of Naledi and Groundwork, uh, we have quite a few people from the community, from workers who, who have managed to dial in and be part of this. Um, the idea is to really get your views, get your engagement, your, your thoughts. So I'm going to be quite strict on time. And um, I really look forward to an, in, in a, a really interesting and engaged discussion. And this is the first of several public events, but I'm going to hand over to Gaylor Montmas Sinclair Claire from TIPS, who's going to just give a very short outline of the project and the objectives, and then I'm going to um, introduce our speakers. I'm going to try and keep track of chat, and, um, and you can raise your hand when you want to speak, and I'm 
uh, I, I'm going to try and manage both those, but Gaylor, you might have to help me on the chat, please. <laughs> okay, sure. over to Gaylor. Sure, and, and thank you. Thanks so much, uh, Peter. Um, I'll be I'll be very brief. I uh, didn't come here to to listen to me, and this is not the purpose of, of today. Um, but just to to of course on behalf of the team uh, from Tips, from the lady, from from Groundwork, and also Peter, just to welcome to to everyone, to all the participants and panelists, but also to all the people who are in in Steve Twitter and, and Emma Lashteni who who are uh, logging in. Um, from uh, from there as well. Um, just want to also just take the opportunity to thank uh, UK Pact, of course, uh, and uh, the British government for the funding of this particular initiative. Um, and we're very grateful uh, for that. Um, overall, though, we are uh, very excited about the partnership that we have structured to, to foster uh, a just transition and specifically a, a bottom up process for just transition in Steve Truete and uh, Emmanuel Schleni uh, in Empumalanga. Um, we aim to be working with, with all the local stakeholders, uh, and that is you know, communities and, and community-based organizations, workers and, and unions in, uh, in uh, Steve Truete and Emmanuel Schleni, also local businesses and you know, chamber of commerce, industry associations, and of course, you know, local, local government, uh, as well as provincial government uh, effectively. We have we have a few um, a, few, a few activities uh, you know that that we are rolling out. Um, we've already had an initial round of engagement uh, in Steve Trote in Marashleni a few weeks ago, really to establish a bit of a baseline with with people who are at the front line of this just transition. Um, and we're planning our, our, our ongoing engagements for uh, for the months to come to really kind of foster uh, uh, this co-development of solutions and proposals in a Malashleni and Nifty Um And that's really the, the crux of, um, uh, of the project uh, effectively. In the process, of course, there's going to be a little bit of capacity building to, to raise awareness and, and understanding. Um, but the crux again is, is really uh, around just being a platform to foster the emergence of solutions from, from the bottom up. Um, and then we aim to document this through a number of, of policy briefs uh, and to help surface some of the proposals, be them for projects, programs, or, or policy interventions. Um, and then through the public events, um, uh, like today, uh, really the idea is, is to try and bridge somewhat um, the uh, sort of the gap between bottom-up and top-down processes um, and, and help uh, play a role uh, in that. So overall, that's really um, the, the essence of, of the project. Um, before uh, handing back to, uh, to Peter, just wanted to, to make a small uh, announcement. Uh, we've now uh, on, uh, on the TIPS website uh, put together uh, a Just Transition Knowledge Platform uh, which is not accessible, uh, uh, and you know you're welcome to to go and check it out. I'll put the link uh, in the chat just now. It's meant to be a repository for for knowledge uh, documents around just transition in South Africa, and it's going to be a, a very living platform uh, which we're going to populate over time. So I encourage you to have a look, uh, use it, and if you know of documents uh, that are missing please uh, do send them to us uh, and then we can uh, add that. Um, but that's it for me. I look forward to the discussion and uh, over to you, Peter. Thanks, Gaylor. And um, just a huge thank you to everyone again for being available. I want to um, hand over to Jane Naidu. I suspect you need little introduction, really. Um, Jay is a, a public figure and social activist, and I've had the privilege of knowing you for many years. And um, you were a minister in President, President Nelson Mandela's cabinet. You were a founding general secretary of Kosovo, and you were you you've been many and are many many um, inspirations to many people and. I'm really looking forward to hear 
um, what you have to say. So about 10, 15 minutes, please, Jay, over to you. Thank you, Peter, and uh, thank you to all of you. I, I, when Peter first raised about me participating, I was excited because uh, this debate on the just transition is not a new debate. It started a long, long time ago. And so I'm glad that we are beginning to see some sort of moving towards certain conclusions that try and bring us to a new consensus about the way forward and post a fossil fuels economy. So I'm grateful to that. And, uh, you know, uh, Mashleni and, 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 and said certainly Steve Stuetter, very close to my heart. That's, uh, you know, that was the, uh, the sort of ground on which we built the very powerful trade unions in, in the past and where some of the most difficult conflicts took place in the past. And so, you know, I, even if I look at the current minister of mineral energies, he was the, he, he was the, he was a trade unionist uh, and, an, and, and a, a chairman from the mines there and, uh, and, and the chairman of the Kosatu Haifeld region in those days, as it was known. So, you know, I'm glad that uh, you know that the just transition is in place because in all my conversations with coal miners, not just in this country but across the world, I have never met a coal miner who says he enjoyed working underground in the coal mines, because as we know, the impact of that in terms of health issues, the the conditions under which people work and uh, you know what we now know today of the environmental hazards of, of coal mining but of course you know people don't have a choice about what employment they have it was what was there and uh, and so in all the discussions i've had with coal miners and miners across the world it's always been about well i don't want to do this work who wants to go kilometers underground in unsafe conditions. But, you know, until we have an alternative, that's the only employment we have. And so the question really, as the world begins to phase out of fossil fuels, and that's an absolute reality because in all the conversations I'm having with either financiers, banks, or looking at people that invest into energy, the movement is clearly away from fossil fuels in a very decisive manner towards uh, you know, uh, an economy is based on, on clean energy. And that's a priority today because as we know, and in a debate 15 years ago, what we agreed as trade unionists was there's no jobs on a dead, planet. So the question really is, how do we survive as a human race, but also create these pathways of, of hope and opportunity for people to have livelihoods and to have the type of incomes that allow them to live, you know, better lives. So I'm very glad about this here because I think we need to move from consensus, which is global today following the Paris uh, protocol on climate change and in which we as a government and as a country have given commitments to the nitty gritty of how do we implement such a protocol at a, at a grassroots level. And, you know, we've been going at this for a decade now in South Africa. And so I think in, in 2020, the Presidential Climate Change Coordination Commission, uh, you know, came forward with a mandate to lay the groundwork for this transition. So anyone who questions or tries to hold up this transition is actually acting against the interest, not just of workers and people today, but of future generations. And I think we must be absolutely clear today. But the challenge that faces us is that coal has fueled about, you know, close to 90% of South Africa's electricity generation. And, uh, you know, it still is a major export, but even those things are going to become at some point stranded assets. And so I think we have to recognize that South Africa today is the third highest carbon emitter in 2018. 
Uh, and so we have to move to a situation where we deal with the questions of employment. You know, up, you know, close to 200,000 workers employed in South Africa's coal mines or coal power plants and, or, or transport associated industries or in the mining sector itself. How do we move from where we are to where we want to be? Uh, how do we create that alternative pathway? What is the industrial strategy needed? You know, just as much as the apartheid rulers in their time created the sassols, Today, we know that the cost of delivering electricity through solar or through renewable energy is immeasurably lower than that of fossil fuels or of nuclear. So the question really is, what is the industrial strategy required to create jobs? And we know there are more, many more jobs in renewable industries than there are in fossil fuel industries. Now, that's a fact of matter. It's a scientific fact. And you know, I don't need to be the expert that produces those, those statistics, but I'm sure it's available to all of you. And then the question becomes, you know, as Minister of Communication, I remember in 1998 at a, a meeting of African ministers of communications, when Africa had less telephones in sub-Saharan Africa than the city of New York. And we said, how do we change policy? How do we look at financing? How do we create universal service so that the delivery of digital communications is not just to the affluent and to the wealthy? And, and in the context of that, we created a strategy that built a smart partnership between public, private, and people themselves, communities themselves. But there were some, and, and today, of course, Africa is one of the fastest growing telecom economies in the world. And if you look at the innovation that's come out of that, if you look at mobile money, well, it came out of places like East Africa and some of the most difficult places where investors never wanted to come. So how do we create the type of incentives and the type of best practices and the certainty of regulation, policy, legal, and, and that environment to create and attract the type of new investment we want to see that comes not just from government, but from also mobilizing private sector investment. And then we have to deal with the question of universal service because there's still across Africa, 700 million people have no access to, to energy. And we have to look at that in South Africa. So how do we think through how we deliver a renewable sector in a context where communities could own these assets? Why should it be just affluent rich people or investors sitting in banks or hedge funds that control assets like this. And these assets that we think of a strategy could deliver immediately access to clean energy in the remotest of communities. And so I would say that in a context where there is of course a huge challenge of unemployment in our country pre-COVID, which has been accelerated by the COVID ep epidemic, how do we look at this as a key economic component of a strategy that delivers clean renewable energy to our communities, creates an industry that the government should publicly support and create a type of industry where we know we can create jobs that, create, that are an alternative uh, to that in the, in the coal industry? And, and then how do we manage a smooth transition in terms of creating these pathways through education, retraining, and the way in which we look at a sector that could become something that incentivizes the tens of thousands of graduates we have walking the streets today, who are black graduates, into the formal economy. So, so for me, the issue is, this is not an issue of an economic argument we're having here. The economics of moving from coal and fossil fuels to a renewable clean energy has been done and it's proven that it creates more jobs. Then it's not an issue of financial because in all of the banks, and I've talked to heads of banks, they are fully committed to invest in renewable energy. And in fact, have taken decisions, formal decisions like FNB or Nedbank not to fund coal in, in going into the future. And then there's the obligations we have as a, so I'm saying, you know, if, if you look at the, the country obligation in terms of the Paris 
talks. We have committed to certain targets, so we have to implement that. And if you look at the environmental issues and challenges that we have, then certainly we cannot punish future generations by continuing in, 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 in deepening the, the, the role of coal in providing energy as a, as a source. So all of these things bring us to a point where there, there is the basis for us moving to a clean, to a smooth transition, a just transition. We must find the way in which workers and their families and their children are empowered to become part of a renewable industry where communities are the primary beneficiaries in access to clean energy and where we commit as a country to what we have submitted as our, as our obligations in terms of climate change to the Paris uh, uh, Climate Change Protocol. And so that brings us to a point where we have to start now implementing it at a local level. And therefore in the area that has been the most important area of, of coal mining in our country, where we, we know ourselves the environmental impact has been pretty disastrous for people living in that area. How do we ensure that there's a just transition? And, and I think that perhaps I should leave it at that. And if there are any questions about it, uh, I'm very happy to take any, uh, to try and offer what I believe. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jay. That, that, the, the, I think you, you've uh, given us some challenging um, thoughts, which I, I, I'll sum up in a minute, but uh, I've seen one question uh, around um, sub-Saharan Africa, can that uh, can um, be the solar generator for both, Af can, it, can it be the solar generator for both Africa and Europe? That's one question. And I, 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 I really want the discussion to be after the panel. So I don't know if there are any other um, questions or comments at this point. Please, can you raise your hand? Um, Okay, I see, um, oh dear, I think I saw one hand pop up and then I think it left. Uh, is there, there, you can unmute yourself. I don't, the hand came and then it went. So uh, uh, does anybody have a, any questions for clarity or, uh, oh, David, I see your hand up. And there was the one hand in the Q&A, the, the question I raised, and um, I'll take one or two points and then I'm gonna move to the panel. David, over to you. Sorry, Peter, that was a mistake. I, I, I tapped the wrong area. Um, <laughs> okay. I'll, I'll, I'll wait to hear the rest of the, of, of the okay. panel. Thanks. All right, thanks. Any Anybody else? Um, there are two questions. Jay, I don't know if you can see, the one is about Sub-Saharan Africa and solar generator, whether it can be a solar generator for Africa and Europe. And the other one is, do you think the unions established in South Africa in the Mpumalanga area can be obstructive to the transition? So this is from Philip Stain has no audio. I think that's quite an interesting question. So, and then I see there's a hand, Karuna, would you like to just ask your question or comment? And then I'll hand over to, to Jay. Hi Jay, it's Karuna here. Jay, could you elaborate a little bit more on how communities can get involved in the just transition process? And what are some examples from other countries, uh, especially countries that you've done some work in? Thanks. Okay, thank you. I'm gonna hand over to Jay and then I'm gonna move to the panel and then open for engagement with everybody. Thanks. Jay. Well, you know, I think if one looks, is looking for examples on scalability on renewable, then you have to look at China. Uh, you know, 
they are now the largest producers of solar panels. And if you look at Germany, a country in Europe that doesn't have all the sunshine that we have, I think uh, in, if my memory serves me right, it's up to 70 to 80% of the energy is coming from renewable sources. So if these countries can achieve it, then we know it works, you know, because there was always a big question about cost. But effectively today, we know that the cost of renewable energy, particularly solar, is much less per kilowatt hour than any other technology. So that's, that's proved. I think if you look at sub-Saharan Africa, and if you look at the fact that there's 700 million people that are without access to clean energy, and unlikely to get access to clean energy if we depend on mega projects. You know, take Inga, you know, the requirements probably goes in the first phase, as I recollect, $20 billion. You know, we're not going to get that type of funding. Uh, uh, although it will be hydroelectric. But if you look at solar, it's imminently possible to do that at low cost. And in a way, I'm living now and speaking to you from a house that is off grid. I have four solar panels and I can do everything. I live here and I live a very comfortable life here. Uh, you know, so off grid, uh, not just in terms of electricity, even in terms of water, you know. So I think that we have got to explore these things. And I'm not talking from you know, theory anymore. I've, I've, I'm actually living it. Uh, and I'm still talking to you. So you know, if, if one thinks about it in that sense, that, then one of the mistakes we made in the telecom expansion that built a digital backbone, of course, one of the things we did do correctly is choose the right technology. We went for digital technology when everyone else was trying to sell us old technology, you know, analog technology from the United States, a technology from Japan, a technologies from, from Europe. And actually, when we met as ministers across Africa, we said, what is a technology that allows us to leap across many layers of infrastructure that increasingly are becoming obsolete? And this is the same debate we've got to have about energy. You know, the idea that we can even consider nuclear is idiotic and insane. And anyone who proposes that defies the imagination and sensibility of anyone that is intelligent. So unless it is about enrichment and unless it's about someone benefiting out of these mega contracts, it makes no economic sense. It makes no ecological sense. And it makes no sense in terms of a cost effectiveness of technology and understanding technology is changing so dramatically. And just like in cell phones, which when it first came out, even I thought this was only for affluent people. It was because of supply side measures in the way in which we, those supply side measures driven by universal service obligations that the access to cell phones should be by ordinary people that we created the prepaid card that changed the game of cellular and mobile access. So the question is, what are the game changes that now in the renewable sector that allows ordinary people to not just have access, but to correct something we missed in the mm -hmm. telecoms revolution? Because we still have not one name brand name of an African company that is producing cell phones or cellular equipment in Africa. And that's a mistake. China will never make that mistake. India will never make the mistake. So the question really at the end of the day, we can do that in a way that creates an economic strategy that empowers people that have been excluded from the economy. As I've mentioned, the black graduates. And the last point I want to make, which is Karuna's point, there is absolutely no reason why Communities cannot be supported by government to have their own grids in villages. And then for excess power to be sold to the national carrier, ESCOP, and they earn a revenue. And they don't have to wait because many of these communities next to these power stations don't have access to, to electricity. And I've seen that across the world. So you give them access and you integrate them into the grid and they get a revenue stream.
So these are community owned assets, which should be our way of addressing unemployment, poverty and exclusion. So let me leave it at that. Thanks. Thank you, Jay. I think you, you've raised uh, points and there are questions in the Q&A that I, I'm going to hold because I think they might get answered by the panelists. So the one was taking the notion of community ownership further. And the other is the role of uh, unions in, in whether unions are being obstructive. So I'm going to hold that. I see Jackie. Hey, Peter, can I, got... can, Peter, Peter, could I just, in, on that union thing, I think people are looking to me and saying, I okay. think that there, of course, will be opposition. Because the way in which the debate is being manipulated is not having access to the full information. So the idea is that there's some tree-hugging environmentalists wanting to take our job away, which is nonsense. And any unionist that uses that argument defies the, no the notion that unions were created and we're at the cutting edge of all innovation we've seen in this country, including everything around reconstruction development. So anyone that uses that as an argument, it's, and what we need is more interactions like this so that we can yeah. sit down and talk mm -hmm. about it and put the information and facts on the table mm -hmm. and not be manipulated by very vested interests who don't want to change because mm -hmm. their hands are on the cookie jar. I, 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 I'm, I'm going to um, usurp my role a little bit here. I, I agree with you to a point. I think that's part of why we're having these uh, events is it, and why what I was trying to say in my introduction is really listening and hearing each other and where we come from. So I think you make a really valid point. I'm just going to very, J Jackie, very quickly let you have the floor and then I really want to move on to the panel because I know that um, Jay you have to leave at half past three and I'd like your response to the panelists. Um, Jackie uh, over to you for a moment. It's, it's, it was a mistake but I just want to congratulate all of you for this kind of event. It's exactly what we need. Thank you. Okay, great. So I, I really want to take this, uh, this um, question and Jay's response around labor uh, and the community, what it means about community ownership. But I think what I'm going to do now is move to the panel. Uh, thank you, Jay, hugely. Um, I'm, I, I, our, one of our panelists is struggling to get in, and I, I don't, I can't see. But Galo is a promise here yet. I don't think so. Not being able to scroll down. So I, I'm, I'm going to ask Lucky Moni to to start the panel, please. And um, Lucky is, uh, I, I'm going to have to read this because I'll never, I can't remember it off by heart, is an energy researcher and national educator at the Chemical Energy Paper Printing Wooden Allied Workers Union, which has a, a, got a very long acronym based in Mpumalanga. And Lucky, Thank you very, very much for joining the panel. You've got uh, about 10 minutes, and then I, I'm actually going to move from one panelist to the next, and then I'm opening um, the floor for uh, Jay, your response, and for uh, attendee responses. So, Lucky, if you could unmute and, un and, and have your video on, that would be fantastic. Thank you. Over to you. All right, thank you, thank you, thank you, Peter. And uh, I would also like to say I'm very honored to share a platform with the veteran, Comrade uh, Jay Naidu. I have been, I used to see him on TV. I had never met him, but uh, I'm, I'm very, very glad to share the platform with him. And uh, let me, let me, state our position as as the power we 
just like uh, 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 Comrade Jay said, the, the, the discussions about just transition have been, they, they, are, they, they have been there for a very, very long time. It is not, it's not a new, it's not a new talk. Yes, we are beginning to be practical about it, but as far as I'm concerned, we are not, we are still far from being, uh, from, from realizing exactly what, what just transition should be. I will highlight points, which will, some of them will be in, in, in contrast to, to what uh, Jay, Comrade Jay said. Firstly, I will talk about cold the value of coal. coal. Coal is a mineral, just like any other minerals that we have in South Africa, but it is the only mineral. It is the only mineral that we have managed as a country to benefit from. Just like Jay said, I'll keep on saying that, we have managed to, to generate electricity from coal. We have managed to beneficiate more from coal in terms of in terms of plastic com components, in terms of gas to liquid fuels. So that's beneficiation of coal. And we have not seen that much in other minerals. So that is why you will find that there are mixed feelings about the shutting down of coal activities. That is why there are mixed feelings about the agenda of, of climate change. That is why there is that discomfort that unions will, will resist the activities of just transition. It is because coal has given us life. So, <clears throat> For just transition to be just for us as trade unions, there are a few things that we, we, we want to see. Yes, we value, we value life. We value life ahead of jobs. That's the first point I would like to make. We value life ahead of jobs. But we know that poverty is a threat to life. As much as we value life ahead of jobs, but anything that looks like taking us towards poverty, it is a problem for us. It is a problem to us. So that is why we will, we will always be likely to resist anything that is likely to take us towards poverty. So <clears throat> the other questions that we always have when we talk about just transition is that we're talking about just transition in the in the in the same sentence of talking about just transition we're talking about moving from coal fired power stations to renewables and nobody has ever came to us and said, here is the, the renewable plant. We will dissect it to display it to you that if you shut down that coal-fired power station, the same jobs, the same economic value that you derived from that power station, you will get it from this renewable plant. Nobody has said that. All what we hear is the potential, but nobody has given us the reality. Yes, I heard Jay saying that China is the largest producer of solar panels. South Africa is gonna be the largest consumer of solar panels. I don't think that is what we like. That is what we want. I don't think that would be just in South Africa. That is not just in South Africa. We also want to produce 
the solar panel. If you can come to us, like I am saying, you say that this is the plant of solar panel from production to generation, production of the panel to the generation of the electricity. I think that will be just to us. Until we arrive there, I think South Africans and also trade unions will be much in support of that. We support it now, but we are not sure about it. We support the idea, but practically we are not sure. We are not sure about it. So <clears throat> that's the problem that we have. Also, we have not been given any assurance that if renewable energies take over from coal, will they be able to support our economy just like the fossil fuels have done? We, we, we still need that assurance. That assurance has never been given to us. So I, I am hoping that these kinds of discussions will head towards that pra practical, practical information. And then I, I can assure you that you will get full support from the trade unions if you can give trade unions such kind of information. So I would like to stop it there, Peter. Oh, fantastic. Lucky you, you, you've really touched on some fantastic uh, questions and points. So the, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm going to just link a little bit with some of what um, Jay raised, which was building smart partnerships. Um, of, of workers and communities being empowered and um, and and really un, I, I, that's something you said at the NJ about uh, understanding what um, what what renewable energy can do and I think those are the points that you've raised lucky uh, really well that you 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 will resist what will take, workers into further poverty. So you need assurance and you need an understanding of um, renewable energy and the role that, that workers can play in not only the production, but in, in the generation. So I'm gonna hold that. Um, I, 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 I see that uh, promise you are here. Thank I'm really pleased you got managed to link in. I'd like to, to, to hand over to you as the second panelist. I'm sorry that your connection meant you, you've missed a little bit, but it's fine. So Promise is, um, she's an environmental justice activist and coordinator of Vukani Environmental Justice Movement in Action that's based, a uh, community-based organize, organization in Emelan Shleni. And um, I think you, I'm hoping you heard some of what Lucky was saying, but I, I would really welcome your contribution. And again, you've got uh, about 10 minutes. And um, if you could unmute yourself and maybe even show um, and your video, that would be great. Promise, over to you. Hi, thank you, Peter. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Promise Mabilo from uh, Emalasen Witten. Um, even though I'm, I'm late, I'm sorry. The network was very low for me, but then um, I missed some of the things that if some other people just said, but what I can um, but what I can say as an activist around um Emalasini, uh, to a just transition and considering a low carbon future is because uh, we are facing a lot of challenges in the 
current situation of uh, relying on fossil fuel or on coal. In everything that we uh, can think of, uh, we, we are thinking of coal. And that is why we see a need of a just transition, especially on energy, because this is a very big problem as in its production processes. A lot of things are damaged, water, air pollution, land, people's health, a lot of thing has um, taken its own direction. But then uh, what we feel uh, as communities around Emalathlene is especially because we are surrounded by um, these coal mines, we are surrounded by uh, these uh, power stations, but uh, we seriously, we, 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 we don't see any benefits of having those um, uh, power stations around us, having all those coal mines around us because we are only benefiting sicknesses and um, we are lacking water. We are living in our own space where we were supposed to be living free, freely, having our own things, having our own water as we are rich in production. But I don't think it is helping us as communities, as communities because once they come in, uh, especially when the power stations comes in, the only thing that we, 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 we have recognized is that um, electricity will rise up and we buy for something, but we get less for what we have purchased for. So I don't think um, we are happy with that. And looking into the future, raising our children with uh, different sicknesses around air pollution. I think we deserve to be in, a, we have to be considering a low carbon future. I think it will be great for the coming generation to see the best of what planet Earth is having because now we are living in another planet that is not helping at all. Yeah. Thank you, Promise. I, I, I really, I, I, I think about um, Lucky, your comment that we will resist anything that will take us into poverty. And I think Promise is, is saying very clearly that actually the, the, the coal and the, the, the living in those regions is actually damaging and they're, they're not, we don't see benefit um, from those nations, you said. We're raising children with sickness. So, um, sorry, I forgot to do my video. Uh, so I, 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 I think we're hearing different uh, positions and different views, and that's exactly what we were really wanting to explore here. So, Thank you, Promise, um, for, for your contribution. Um, I, I really appreciate it. I, I'd, I'd like to move on now to Nonkololeko Makua, who is the climate change champion in um, Emelanchleni municipality and also manager of parks, cemeteries, and public open spaces in the environmental and Waste Management Directorate um, of, of the municipality. So, uh, Nonkololeko, if you could talk for about 10 minutes and let's hear where you're coming from. And then our last uh, panelist will be from, um, will be Alex Kumalo from the um, um, Minerals Council. So, Nonkololeko, over to you. Thank you. Thank you uh, so much, Peter. Good afternoon, uh, everybody, colleagues. Um, my name is Nongul Lewo, and thank you for the introduction, Peter. I've got a little bit of flu, so my voice is more coarse than usual. You'll forgive me for that. Okay. 
As uh, Evanathani local municipality uh, colleagues, we all know that um, we are one of the municipalities that is surrounded uh, by these um, power stations, uh, mines, and all these industries that contribute uh, to the air pollution we're experiencing, uh, land degradation, and water pollution, as a promise as already alluded to. And what we have done as the municipality, um, since um, we were invited by uh, the national, provincial, and district to join hands with them, you know, in the fight of climate change, is that uh, we have collaborated with other uh, stakeholders like uh, Sustainable Energy Africa to assist the municipality in the development of its uh, own uh, climate change uh, strategy. It is my pleasure to, uh, to announce that um, the draft uh, climate change strategy for Emalacheni uh, will be uh, submitted on um, Friday and it will go to council for approval. And then after that, uh, it will go for public participation. That's one. And we have also uh, developed the climate change uh, vulnerability and assessment plan it has not gone to cancel uh, as yet, but together with the climate change uh, strategy, they'll both uh, go to a uh, cancel uh, sometime next week. And hopefully when we start the new financial year, uh, they will be approved. As for the just transition, uh, I know that province has already uh, started on uh, that journey. They are developing a, 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 a strategy for the whole province. Uh, together with the uh, University of Cape Town. There are a few uh, recommendations uh, that uh, were uh, done uh, for the development of this um, uh, just transition st uh, strategy for the um, Bumalanga province. And uh, we are uh, with the, together with province, uh, we share this information on just transition in our climate change forums that are held uh, quarterly. So we are taking uh, the climate change uh, issue uh, very seriously as we are one of the municipalities that will be highly, highly affected uh, by this uh, just uh, transition. And I think uh, I'll, I'll, I'll make mention that it is unfortunate that uh, you know we are still battling and struggling to make uh, people understand you know, and communities understand uh, the issue of climate change. And while we are still there, we are now uh, going to engage them on another new issue, which is a uh, just transition. So we've got a uh, double trouble. And uh, for us, a uh, just transition, uh, it will mean um, a whole lot of uh, things to so many people. I, I am sure that we will be faced with a lot of resistance because when you speak of just transition, people just assume a uh, more job losses, a uh, uh, more inequality, poverty, and you know all the negative things. Uh, people fail to see any good in this just transition. Like the uh, previous speaker said, that call, you know, to people of Emalacheni, it was life. It was giving people of Emalacheni life. So when you want to take that away from them, obviously, you know, they'll be found wanting and it will be so difficult and challenging, you know, to convince them or to have everybody, you know, sitting around the table and or, or having an understanding on this uh, uh, chance transition. So, but hopefully, we hope that, you know, with the intervention from a national government and uh, other, you know, important stakeholders, we will, you know, um, you know, uh, make people to understand and have their buy-in and, you know, make them understand what is this trans uh, just transition? What is it bringing to them? What does it mean? How is it going to affect uh, their livelihood uh, and so forth? And what will be the benefits of, of this uh, just transition? And is a, 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 and people, you know, they'll be looking at uh, things like, is it going to bring more jobs? Is it going to do this and that? So, you know, it brings in the uh, question of um, 
a, a economy diversification. So in MLSN, we all know that the only source uh, of our economy is coal. So if you want to take that away from people, then what other options are there? What other options are you bringing on the table? You know, and uh, I've heard a lot of speakers uh, talking about you know just transition from uh, coal to renewables, but I I I, I haven't heard any anyone you know touching on the issue of what are are other uses of coal, you know? Are we saying that we must just do away with coal in totality or can coal mining uh, continue but use, you know, a coal in other uses that are environmentally friendly? And in saying so, uh, if that is the option, do we have the technology to do that? Because I know that for instance, coal is used in, 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 in cement. So, can we look at other uh, uh, ways that this coal can be used, yet at the same time not harming the environment or the health and well-being of the people? Um, I also um, heard that there are successful stories uh, in other countries on just transition. That just transition has created uh, more jobs uh, than ever. So, but you know, I would uh, be happy if maybe we can put that into a, a, a South African context, because we we should not say just transition and compare ourselves to well-developed countries, uh, because we don't know how they did it, how they got there. So maybe what we need to do is to try and learn how they did what they did to, to have these uh, successful stories because we are a third world country uh, and we are talking about first world countries. And there's a gentleman that mentioned that, uh, um, like uh, Mr. Naidu said, China is the largest producer of solar uh, uh, panel and South Africa will be the largest consumer. And obviously he is right to say, we don't want that. And you know, I also want to emphasize uh, uh, that point that we don't want that. We as South Africans, we are tired of being uh, consumers of our own uh, uh, minerals. We, we always export our minerals. When they come back, they come back as uh, things that we must buy. And we do not have the technology to do that. Hence, I am saying, why don't we explore and research, and research. on other things that can that be used to use good. So we are the producers, producers of our products are there, not the consumers, as you know, it is perceived uh, by the whole world. I think I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Nonka Laleko. I, 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 I've, I want, I'd like to just pick up on a couple of things that maybe will go into the, the discussion. Um, your climate change, your climate change strategy is going will eventually go for public participation and and how you will do that links with something you said about um you, you, you getting people to understand climate change and the just transition and so the 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 question of public participation is crucial how people communicate with each other so that um that this idea of coal being life that there could be life with something something else and um yeah your your the, your question about coal i saw a comment come in that uh, the only place for coal is to leave it in the ground but uh, let's take that up for the 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 discussion i i would like to move to our last uh, panelist and then I'm really hoping I, I've certainly got lots of thoughts that have come up already but I'd like to introduce Alex Kumalo who is head of social performance at the Minerals Council South Africa and he 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 has a long-standing long-standing experience and expertise in socio-economic development and transformation strategies. So, uh, Alex, you're coming from the other side, um, and it would it, I'm really looking forward to hearing 
what you have to say. And so please unmute and if we can see you as well, that would be fantastic. Um, so again, about 10 minutes for you too. Thanks, Alex. No, thanks, um, Peter. I am, you need to guide me, please. Um, I'm trying to share a screen. Just let me know if I'm sharing the correct screen. All right. All right. Um, um, thanks, um, Peter. Um, good afternoon, um, colleagues um, and to the panelists. This is always going to be a challenging one. Um, I'm coming from a pariah industry, um, being from the Minerals Council. Um, and one of the things we do is to actually dig the coal out of the ground. Um, so you'll bear with me. Um, do shoot me after my presentation and then we can take it from there. I, I just like to give us you know, a, 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 a quick snapshot um, of, um, of the coal industry. Um, some of this you have heard. Um, it is the biggest mining sector in South Africa by volume, um, 24%. Um, by, by value, that would be the PGMs. Um, and our production is primarily consumed by the um, electricity sector, as we all know. Um, so we are tied to the hip with ESCOM. We have got um, 91,000 direct employees, um, and we generate those employees generate earnings of um, 30.5 billion. Sorry, these are figures from 2020. Um, royalties paid is some 1.7 billion rand that goes into the national fiscal, just on royalties, and this is not on um, other um, company taxes. And the production is 252 million tons. Total sales amount to almost 133 billion rand. Um, that cannot be sneezed at, um, but as everyone has said, um, there is a number of challenges. And we do have this just transition um, juxtaposed against our reality. I mean, we do agree as an industry um, that there is a need for a just energy transition. Um, it is critical and it is, it is globally relevant. Globally, um, we share the view that there needs to be some kind of decarbonization taking place. Um, and as countries embark on these different starting points, um, the concept of just transition is indeed gaining relevance, um, even amongst you know, the industry. I mean, Jay was talking about you know, having you know, um, dealt with a number of, of workers in the coal sector. Um, who also share the same um, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling that you know we do need to move um, a little along the you know the spectrum nationally and I think everyone knows this and it's been said by other panelists uh, we've got a very unique um, starting point um, where our economy is heavily reliant on fossil fuels um, and um, it also has got embedded social socioeconomic challenges so if you go to secunda um, you've got a Saso. If you go to Emalathini and Steve Trete, you've got um, some 70 odd um, holes in the ground um, where coal, coal is mined. But also um, coal um, is closely linked um, to um, a number of sectors. Again, you know, mining, um, power generation, petrochemicals. Um, some of our communities and community identities are closely tied to fossil fuels. Um, that said, we also we all want climate and um, climate justice. We all want to raise our children in an environment that is not polluted. You know, if you um, drive out of um, um, Bumalanga towards Gauteng um, around sunset, you see beautiful sunsets, and that's not because of just natural occurrences; it's because of pollution. And yes, workers do need um, a just transition to um, renewable energy. That we do admit to. The, the Paris Agreement um, requires national plans on climate change that include just transition measures. And that includes um, quality jobs and decent work. So how do we um, navigate um, this reality of ours? As an industry, we believe that we need to review and analyze our economics, social, political, and technological futures um, for the coal industry. Because it will not die today, it will not die tomorrow. But we do understand that it's got some serious implications going forward. We need to understand the implications of different scenarios for Emalasteni and Steve Chuete, those two municipalities in particular, but also for the province and the country as a whole. Because again, 
you know, some 90 odd percent of our electricity in this country is generated from, um, from fossil fuels. We do need to identify um, high impact and easy to roll up and technologies. Um, Nungul Lego was talking about technologies around clean coal and so forth. Um, none of our power stations are, are, um, are designed um, to incorporate clean coal technologies and they don't come cheap. Um, but going forward, um, it is unlikely that um, we would be able to jump on the bandwagon of clean coal technologies simply because um, there may not be a future for, for new B2Bs and Gosilas um, in this country. But in doing so, we need to ensure that there's alignment with other stakeholders that are involved um, and impacted by um, just, in, just um, energy transition initiatives, the NBI, ESCOM, communities in particular, civil society organizations. Um, um, from where I sit, you know, we engage with um, a lot of NGOs um, that are fighting the civil battles. We also need to ensure that you know, all the spheres of government are involved in this, from local, district, province, uh, international. And ultimately, we need to craft strategic risk management measures um, regarding the just energy transition. Because it is not just one of those where you open the door and you close the door and then open another one. It is more of um, 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 a long road. And we think that we need to develop um, scenarios that are detailed, that take into account then our um, global, national, and local conditions um, into account. By doing so, we think that you know, we can create a common vision for a just transition, which currently does not exist. Um, we'd be able to identify opportunities and key enablers. And again, you know, um, it won't be easy to switch off you know, from, from coal um, 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 fired power stations you know, to solar plants, for instance. Uh, we need to enable the development and implementation of economic and social interventions that are vital for adaptation and the mitigation of negative externalities from this energy um, um, transition. And again, you know, even if we were to set up solar plants in South Africa, um, 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 solar panel plants in South Africa, can we compete with China? Um, and we need to ensure that you know, there's the enhancement of um, the integration and mutualization of efforts um, aligned with um, existing community um, um, strategies. And I mean, um, Nukul will tell you how um, difficult it is, you know, to have integrated planning um, um, happen at some um, local level. And we think that, you know, it will only be that way um, that we can then get through to achieving that just, equitable and inclusive energy um, transition, including workers, communities, um, captains of industry, government um, and civil society at large. And just to, um, um, just to close, um, um, Peter, um, there's these two slides that I like. They are from China. Um, and I know that China is also a pariah state in many respects. Um, you have um, what used to be um, a stone quarry, um, which is now a hotel not too far from um, Shanghai. It's a five-star hotel. And then you also have a solar farm that has been built on an old um, coal mine. So, we do need to um, um, think a bit um, differently um, and begin to, you know, to wear um, a different hat in terms of where to from here. Um, I do not understand, um, although I work in the industry, why we still continue um, to have mining companies rather than have um, energy companies. Um, but obviously, you know, you do need to ensure that uh, the legal framework is there to allow us to, to do that. I mean, currently, you might have seen the debate around. Um, the 10 megawatts cap that you know our mining companies um, have been um, given to generate their own energy. Uh, whereas we are looking for 50 megawatts um, because we think that becomes a scale only coming at that point. And such plants could be used to empower communities as well. Because no one says, you know, um, as part of BEE, um, communities only need to own, you know, in a particular mining company. Why not, you know, in other businesses within um, that? And if solar production is one of the alternatives. So be it, you know, um, it could be um, one way of ensuring that we are um, solving the challenges that will come on, um, 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 together with um, just energy transition. And Peter, I'm going to leave it there for now, and then I'm being able to give it to you. Thank you. I, 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 one of the 
things that I take strongly, well, a few things that you've said, you know, that um, the, the, the acknowledging that you, you, you're, you, you are cold, that's, um, that's your core business. So it, it's coming from a different perspective. But I, what I heard you say very strongly is that we need to um, move with, with the, the idea of a just transition and we need to think differently and wear different hats. And I, 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 I think that's what's being called from all of us. And uh, I, I like your, your ideas, we, when we, which we also talked about when I first um, met you was this notion of energy company. And, and I, I think, um, Jay, I would like to um, see what responses you might bring in case you have to leave soon. And then I'm going to open the floor and try and address some of the questions in the Q&A. So, um, it, it would be good to get, I don't, Jay, can you see any of the questions that are there? I think one or two were for you, but let, let's get your general response and then I'll um, see what we can draw up. But, but thank you, everyone. I think those, all the panelists have raised fantastic um, uh, ideas that we need to, we have to engage with. So Jay, over to you. Well, thank you, Peter. And it's it's really been good for me to hear this conversation. You know, I come from a time when the unions and employers and the state were waging war. And, uh, and we still were able to build a labor movement. We still were able to negotiate collective agreements. And uh, we still were able to try and, you know, sort of work so that we don't you know, destroy everything, you know, and I think the labor movement played an incredible role, uh, Lucky, in managing the transition, because I think we, if it wasn't for the labor movement, uh, you know, many things would have gone really horribly wrong. And it went right because, you know, there was thought leadership coming from the, from the unions and not from leaders, but from ordinary workers, many of them living in hostels, when you ask their advice, they will give you a lot more solutions about how to run business properly and more efficiently than all the consultants we pay today, huge amounts of money. So Lucky, I, I want to particularly address those issues because it must, my comments must be seen in that context. And thank you, Alex, because I look at what you said and what Lucky stands for, and I see two sides of the spectrum and I see a tremendous amount of common ground, not divergent ground, not divergent views. Now the issue is, how do we co-create with transparency and full disclosure to everyone, including workers, including communities, including scientists, environmentalists, government people, an open and transparent debate about how do we build the transition because we don't have an alternative on this. That's our commitment as a country and that's our commitment to future generations. And whether it's the workers today or their children, this is our commitment. So when I, you know, our, the issue of livelihoods, of poverty, of inequality, of hunger, and of participation in the formal economy is all things that we should be debating in this country today, openly, so that everyone has a view. Uh, and so and everyone's views is accommodated. You know? So I, I really like the idea that it's like the development of the Freedom Charter or the Reconstruction and Development Program. It was grassroots organizations that crystallized what we want to do to replace apartheid. And then, we had leadership, ethical leadership from the top that understood it and built the type of tools and policies, rules, regulations, and programs, and how we use the resources of government and what partnerships we have with other sectors like the private sector or trade unions or communities to build a pathway of hope and opportunity. So 
I hope that this we can do this here. And so uh, I absolutely agree that you can't talk about you know, something you don't have information on, Lucky. So I think that we need to put concrete plans on the table that demonstrates how the industry as we phase out, what Alex is saying, which is a sunset industry, can be transitioned into alternatives. You know, so what are the details about a renewable sector? How many jobs are created? Where is the investment going to come? How do we train people for that? Who should own that? You know, and one of the things with the IPPs, I feel that was uh, not done correctly, is that although it's the right strategic choice to say IPPs and renewable, it's what is, how can we make these IPPs also community owned? And where the benefits derive to communities or to workers or to, you know, to graduates who are walking the streets today that are unemployed. You know? I am not suggesting that we're going to import. That's the example I used in telecoms is learn from the mistakes of telecoms. That today we still do not have in the whole of Africa, an African company producing cell phones. So, or telephone equipment or telecoms equipment. That's a mistake. Learn from China there, learn from India, they learn from any other country. What is our industrial strategy around this? You know, it very much like how Sasol came as a technology. It wasn't because a couple of people that were private sector got together. It was state led and it was state owned. So how do we do that today? Uh, and I think that's a very important question, you know. Um, so, Don Kuleleko raised the issue of, and, and, and the climate activists before that, of health impacts, land degradation, air pollution, health impact. There's enough of the science that is telling us that this type of mining, and particularly coal mining, is devastating to the environment. And it affects a lot more people. And so, yes, again, another reason, health reason, economic reason, environmental reason, why we need to transition. Uh, but again, transition to what? You know, and I think that we don't want to deepen poverty. So we have to answer that question. Um, now, if you look at the issue of what Alex said, which is really important, Alex, you put the, the document, you put the information on the table, you know? So 132 billion year per year, industry. It's a huge part of this economy. Uh, 1.7 billion royalties and employees that are entitled to 32 billion, you know. But Alex, you know, let's go into that 32 billion. Who benefits from it? How is that distributed? How much goes to the top management and the executives and how much goes to ordinary workers that are at the coal face of the coal mining industry? You know, so what do we have? You know, you take the platinum industry and Marikana. It's like, you know, people are still struggling to earn, you know, 17 and a half thousand rand a month for doing the, some of the most dangerous work in this country. So the issue again is, you know, you know, how do we look at the distribution of the surplus? And that has to be a conversation we have. And so, you know, and, and for me, the issue of a renewable sector has to be promoted by the state and it has to be subsidized by the state. You know, just as much as farmers today in the US or Europe are paid huge amounts of money to produce food that is dumped in Africa and has an impact on us building a, a smallholder farming base in the continent. And that's what traps us in hunger, that we are epicenter of hunger. So how do we do that? What is the public policy required? What is the partnerships required? What is the debate required so that we come to something we build as a consensus? We built consensuses before. And so I have, you know, I think that we need bold leadership today. You know, we have to look at alternatives to the, the, the mining sector just across the board. And I think mining companies are already looking at this, transitioning out of mining in to something new. And what you put, uh, uh, Alex, on the thing is demonstration, you know, the coal mine, the solar array system on an old coal mine, or, you know, what they've done in a quarry. These are alternative pathways. 
I think the biggest thing we miss in South Africa is political will that we used to have to say, we're going to do this together and we're going to do it in a transparent way. And the beneficiaries are going to be ordinary people. And while we can get investment and there will be private investors, this has to be a model that at the end of the day, as we transition to a renewable sector, it's communities benefiting from access to clean energy, but also income models related to clean energy. It's workers participating as we look at the retraining of people and the way we build alternative paradigms. It's government benefiting in terms of increased revenue streams to them. And it's this, this, and the society benefiting in that we have more health protection and more addressing of those environmental hazards that today are having a devastating impact, especially on, on children. And lastly, I think that, you know, if you think about it, it's building an alternative paradigm that we need as a country because unemployment is exploding in this country. And we have to move from this concept of employment to livelihoods. And what are those livelihoods? How do we use land? How do we use our assets? How do we train our people to create a very different economic paradigm where we're not waiting for someone to come and do something for us. We are empowering communities from the bottom up. And hopefully we will have ethical leadership coming out in our, in our country shortly, you know, that can support that direction. So that's my, my, my input. Thank you very much to Peter. Sure. Yeah. Uh, Jay, uh, um, sure. Very inspiring and wonderful kind of pulling together the, the different inputs and yeah the, the you're raising very very critical issues how how do we co-create how do we ensure um political will and uh transparency and i i i i really love your last point about moving from a focus on employment, which is sort of important, but narrows to this concept of livelihood. But I would, I, I would really, well, I, I thank you, Jay. I know at some point you might leave before the end, but um, I would like to open the floor to the panelists to respond to attendees. Um, I see Eugene has a hand up and yeah, let's take a few comments from the floor. I'm hoping people will be brave enough to speak. There are some Q and A's and then I'd, I'll, I'll open back to the panel. Eugene, over to you. Please can you maybe just say who you are and which sector you're from and um let's keep this as an open debate please eugene thank you madam chair can you hear me, hear me? yes i can thank you right, right. Um, um, see my name, my name, Eugene. Eugene. i'm uh, an owner I'm, uh, of a uh, business uh, in Nizelberg. i'm also past, past president, president of the chamber of commerce and i currently chair the c20 local economic development forum in trying to grapple with all of these issues and having been a resident of Middleburg for more than 30 years, and the company I run has been in business for nearly 135 years, of which it was banned after the World War to Middleburg, and we've been in Middleburg operating since 1906. So we're a well-established part of Middleburg, the town, Middleburg, the community. The issue around energy is one close to my heart because our business is a foundry engineering company. And when we start looking at the dynamics of this business, one's got to ask South African foundries exporting globally. We export extensively our equipment to the mining industries around the world. So to South African concept, to hear that our current South African customer base may disappear is problematic, but not only that, because we're a foundry, we use a lot of electricity. And we understand the electricity comes from coal. We have 10 year, 14 years ago now, 2008, we built and commissioned 
our own gas-fired power plant generating 10.6 megawatt of electricity. A wonderful investment, cost us 100 million rand at the time. We were very optimistic we'd be able to sell the electricity to Eskom, the unused portion of ours. Unfortunately, Eskom does not want to buy electricity from independent power producers. The second issue is, uh, as the chair of the Local Economic Development Forum, one of our focuses, of course, is how do we ensure that we create uh, business opportunities within the Greater Middleburg area. Now, one of our biggest threats is the closure of the local power stations. Just out of Hendrina Power Station, when it closes, we're going to see 2,500 people without work. That's directly. That means that we're going to see our local economy suffer by these 2,500 people not being able to spend the money in our community. It's going to create a lot of other economic hardship. And those are the issues which I think we've got to be very realistic about. It's a wonderful idea to zip the tent and leave the coal in the ground. But if we listen to the economic impact of that, it's horrific. South Africa, South Africa needs electricity. electricity. Businesses, Businesses need electricity. Need electricity. And, without and without that, we're not going to have an economy. economy. And that's and what Jay's view is. is. It's pointless digging everything, everything out of the ground, ground or ground, planting planting the ground. ground. We actually need a diversified economy. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Um, I see quite a lot of hands. I'm sure um, there, there are going to be responses to that and the speakers. So let me take uh, AB. As I hope that I pronounced you correctly. I think your hand came up first and then Matt. AB, over to you. Uh, hi, Peter. Thanks. Thanks. It's uh, meant to be Abel Sakau. Uh, yeah. Yes, I, I get feedback. I just want to contribute by also bringing a different uh, perspective to the debate. Uh, coming from a company that's in coal mining, uh, we currently uh, transitioning our organization. Uh, we building a energy a business that focuses on renewable energy. One of our biggest constraints that generally does not come into this discussion is that our ability to raise capital to continue with our business is becoming uh, 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 difficult every single day. So the transition or the just transition we might not be uh, able to direct it the way we want to do it because you also have a global investment market that supports businesses like ours if we want to expand our businesses you've got insurance companies that are willing to insure our business but recently we've seen that those uh, 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 instruments are starting to dry out so we're gonna end up with a business that we can fund, that we can expand, because those are the realities. Unless you self-fund your business, uh, you are unable to raise capital in any market because no one is willing to fund coal. So when we talk of the just transition, it has to be able to encompass all the constraints that comes with mining coal, you know, to say, how do we first, uh, track this transition, having to understand that the capital market is shifting away from coal. So if we keep on saying, no, we're gonna still continue with coal because it supports so many jobs, then you also have then to have a discussion on say, who then is going to fund it? Is it the South African government willing to fund it? If you've got a source of funding, then yes, we can have as much time with coal. But unfortunately, the realities on the ground is that we have ran out of time. We are losing a, a, a time to transition while there's still money left into the system that allows us to just to transition our communities, to transition into a low carbon portfolio. So I think that's an element that I want to raise into this discussion to say, it's important also to bring that element there to say, we don't have endless bags of money. We go into open market to get financing and that financing is drying up. 
and it's tying up. Tying up. Thank, very yeah, thank, thank you. I think you've raised a really important point around, around funding. I'm sorry to cut you a little bit because I want to, I'd like to, if people could just keep a little bit tight the comments because I really want the panel to be able to come in before towards the end, but you've raised uh, 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 the, the two speakers so far um, have raised issues about what the, the, the industry that you're in and financing. Um, and uh, there are quite a few questions in the Q&A that I'd like to maybe address or, or, or allude to, but also it'd be great to hear if can anyone from the community can also speak? Um, Matt, I see your hand up. Grace, Grace, um, I'd, I'll give a quick run of who I am or the company. I run a company called Township Green. We, um, are, we seek to um, uplift various communities through environmental initiatives. Uh, we engage with municipalities, mines, and um, housing departments. Um, without going into details, uh, Jay, um, Mr. Jay Naidu mentioned that banks are committed to renewable energy. Um, I'd like to know which bank. <laughs> and um, the second thing I liked, um, he also mentioned that um, to build smart partnerships. I think he was talking about um, SMMEs building smart par partnerships with government as well as private sectors. I like that. And I want to um, mention that on that, if government could really get involved with SMMEs and looking into these contracts, these uh, uh, smart partnership contracts that SMMEs are getting into and, 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 and look into assisting SMMEs with those uh, partnerships um, in terms of legal implications. Um, because often SMMEs lose their products, lose their businesses to um, big organizations because they just don't have the capital or the know or the legal background. Um, yeah, that's basically all I wanted to say that um, I'm not too sure about the banks. I'd like to know which bank is assisting SMMEs. Yeah. Thank you. Um, that, that was a, partly a direct question to, to you, Jay. I see you, you're still there. Um, I don't see other hands just yet. There are a few questions, but uh, I don't know if you want to respond to that, Jay, and then maybe um, I'll, I'll raise some of the Q&A and see if the panel can respond. Oh, I see, um, um, Cisue, you have a hand up, so maybe you could come in at this point, please. Oh, thank you very much. I just want to say thank you all to the for all the speakers, um, I really you know, want to emphasize that there's been this notion that trade unions are opposed to renewable energy. And I think that is um, far from the truth. Um, you know, trade unions have been advocating for renewable energy for a long time, as well as the just transition. But um, there has not been a plan that takes workers and people uh, along with them as to how we move towards renewable energy and we ensure that we don't have the, a privatized renewable energy uh, because you know um, uh, for us as in, in, the, in the trade union movement energy is a, a basic need and there's still we know that there's still a lot of people who suffer from energy poverty and so this is why um, we have always advocated for a socially owned renewable energy sector. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you, Siswe. Um, so I, 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 I think that's a really good point. Um, can, can we, 
so Jay's asking what what the question um, was, and now I have to say it's gone from me. I didn't write it down. That was um, um, Matt, your question, but uh, I I would actually I see Ramato has a I would like has a hand up, and then I want to. Uh, hand over to the panel because we're we're going to be running out of time. So, um, Ramato, it's over to you. Yeah, thanks. Just to ask to help Jay, the question was uh, which banks provide funding. I think that was the question directed to Comrade Jay. The, yes, the thank issue, you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'll send an invoice to you. The, the question I want to ask really is that uh, I come, I previously come from the ICT sector, in particular the telecommunications sector that uh, Comrade Jay mentioned earlier on, that when he became the minister in South Africa, the telecommunication penetration was less than 9.8%, uh, less than 10%. It was worth in black communities. And I remember in the union initially when discussions happened around the introduction of the mobile telephony, we had issues. Uh, and But we, we also changed our view because we had, we had the researchers from all over the world also advising us. The, the question that I want to pose is to those of us who are in the labor movement currently, have they also you know, looked at what happened in the ICT sector, given that the fact that we are talking today is the intervention and the involvement of the, the mobile sector in ensuring that uh, you, know, you increase telephone, you increase access to ICT, and it also has a big effect in terms of socioeconomic development. So I just want to check if they have they also you know, studied uh, sectors like the ICT sector in terms of the introduction of new technologies. Thank you. Thank you. Um... I am going to allow uh, Jay, if you want to respond briefly, if you're still there, and then I'd like to hand back to the panelists and to get their response from some of the questions. Sorry, Peter, Sorry, this, Peter could this, you repeat, could you repeat, repeat the question? The, question? Uh, the, the, the one wa was around the the banks, um, which banks are supporting um, renewable energy. And then um, the other was around um, taking ICT uh, as, as an example. Um, have they, has, ha, are there examples of how that's been expanded or studies in that sector that can be used I think that's what was being asked now by yeah, Ramato yeah. in, in, in the renewable and as an example for renewable energy. Well, well you know, the, you know, the, that's a very that's good, a very point, good point. point because uh, I think that, uh, you know, it's how we come to this plan that Lucky is talking about. And how do we integrate it? So in the telecommunication sector around the development of the white paper and the restructuring around introducing mobile telephony, we, the unions were involved. And in fact, we even did study trips together and we looked at researches together and we traveled the world, looking at how renewable sectors work and how do you transition out. So these study tours that we did involved different stakeholders. And I'm saying that's what we should look at. It's a small investment to make, but I think we should go and look at where solar has been successful and why it's been successful and how did countries transition out. We should go and look and examine, you know, India and in, in India, there's something called the Barefoot College. They train women who have no education from the remotest villages across the world in making so solar panels. In creating livelihoods. So there is tremendous technology today. Uh, costs are dropping, the technology getting easier to assemble. It's not rocket science anymore. The banks 
already, as I said to you, as I know, the two major banks in, in South Africa that I know, FNB and, and Bank, have taken decisions to move out of funding coal. So they're transitioning. Then we have all these development finance institutions in our country. How do we make sure that it's not just, of course, we must have private sector entrepreneurs and support entrepreneurial activity that are prepared to take the risk and build assets. But I like that question of social assets as well. So how do we create social assets in the hands of communities, not BE groups, but communities actually owning their own assets? And, and how do they get an income by selling what their access to, to the grid? So all of these are components of an economic strategy that we can work from the bottom up. And so I'm, I'm convinced that the only thing missing is political will. Because if I listen to all the people and all the stakeholders here, everyone agrees that we are going to have to move towards renewable energy. Everyone agrees that mining is a, is, is a sunset industry. Even the mining companies themselves agree this. The banks are agreeing this. The experts are agreeing this. The United Nations is, uh, is, is steering the conversation. We all agree. How do we move forward in the most democratic and transparent way so that the, the, the surpluses, the rewards, the, the benefits are not captured by a predatory elite? That's the question. And if we can do that, and why the role of unions and strong organizations on the ground are so important and ethical businesses that are not paying to buy favors and contracts are so important. And that's why governance and leadership is important. We have no choice but to go through this transition. And we have to do it with ethics and we have to do it with transparency and we have to do it with participation and we have to do it in a way that everyone benefits. Thank you, Jay. Um, and I, 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 I think, um, yeah, your, your, your final, your point is the political will. We, uh, we all agreeing this is the direction, and it's some of the hows. And um, I've looked at uh, some of the questions, but I've, I, given that we're now ten to four, I would like to hand over to the other, the pan, the four panelists, and get your um, responses, uh, please, before we uh, close. We might go slightly over four. We started a bit late, but let's try and stick with four. So. Um, I, I, I'd like to go back to you, Lucky, you, if you could start um, and short wrap ups and responses to what you've heard. And some of the questions are around timelines and how do we engage with um, ESCOM and Exara, et cetera. So yeah, I, let me let you um, respond, uh, Alex. I mean, sorry, uh, Lucky first. Thank, thank you, thank you, Peter. Mine is, is, is to add to what has been said more than responding. And I also want to highlight a point that I was hoping that somebody will raise, which was not raised. <clears throat> raised. The point about exports, exports of coal. The exports of coal creates a very big confusion. As much as uh, uh, Comrade Jay says that there is a lack of political will, my question is there, from which side? Lack, lack of political will from politicians or from business? Because politi politicians might have a will to have this succeeding, but if business is opposed to it, they'll do everything in their power to undermine it. So if really we were, business was serious about climate change and the subsequent uh, just transition, we would limit the export of coal. We would make sure that coal that we have that we mine domestic is, is, is used to support domestic business. 
we, we, we just had load shedding today, but there is a power station that is being closed down. That, that doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. And the, you ask yourself, what is just about this transition? You see, you, you ask yourself, what is just about, what, about transition, this transition? So let me move from there and go to support the point that was made by Jay about, about the, the telecommunication, the mistake that was made. I will add there, the mistake did not start with telecommunication. The mistake started, it started and is still sitting with us even today with nuclear power. At some point, I don't know now, we were the only country that has got nuclear power in Africa. But we cannot manufacture, we cannot, we cannot build nuclear power in any country, in anywhere. South Africans cannot build nuclear power in Africa, anywhere. Even ourselves, even maintaining that nuclear power, we still go to the French people. We still invite people to build what we aspire to have as a, as a nuclear power. So what does that thing mean? We don't care about technology transfer. So I wish even in this case, if we are to have just transition, that is just, we need to also focus on the true transfer of technology. We should be able, just like UJ saying, be like what India is doing, be able to build the solar panels ourselves, innovate the technology that maybe we buy. We, we've got, we've got uh, places like uh, CSIR, which were meant to do, to support the country with those technology. <laughs> We don't know what their roles are. They are not even in this panel, even now. You see, so, so there, there is that confusion. That is why I'm saying that, yes, we, we need political will from which side? From politicians or from business? Which side do we want that political way? So that, that's, that's the point I wanted to make. Thank, thank, thank you, thank you. Thank you. So I think um, you, you, we haven't talk much about nuclear and maybe it's an area that we can look at for future dialogues um, but you've raised a question about where does the political will sit I, I would like to I would like promise could you um, give some last words and um, responses please I know you've had network challenges, but I'm glad to see you're there. Could you give your last words, please? Okay, thank you. Um, for me, I, um, I think, uh, what I think is that, um, how do we uh, maybe make sure that if, if we agree with uh, this renewable in the house, then, I see lack of uh, interest in our uh, government uh, because even though when we 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 speak about uh, these issues that we are facing in daily basis, they seem not uh, to turn a blind eye as if they don't see anything that is happening around. But what I wish, I wish that we we if we are really serious on moving or shifting to a, a, a new energy system, why can't we just try something, not a big thing, just to test the ground, um, maybe in an informal settlement where there is nothing that is existing as a development plan. Then we, we, we test those, um, some of the things that we think can work then how and uh, we push on how we 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 raise awarenesses on the ground because we can we, we can't just sit down and wait like uh, the pandemic uh, then when we wake up tomorrow they say uh, call is no more 
but now there are still people who are working. Is the message of a just transition is communicated very well with those workers. What do the workers think? What are they planning to do? Because at the end, what we are seeing now is that all the, um, uh, the mines are, are, are closing and they close without even paying people. It's a difficult situation. Why are they running away? Because there is something that has to be done for a just transition by helping those people who are still working for them. So I, um, what I think is that uh, the messaging is not moving as we wish as activists on the ground or as communities on the ground. I think we have to move as fast as we can and do something immediately. Thank you. Thanks, Promise. Um, I think the, those are that's very important that that the the, the messaging isn't working. I, I see quite a few people are, are, are leaving because we've almost at four. So, but we I would like um, Nonka Laleko and then um, Alex mm -hmm. to sum up, please. Your your mm -hmm. final points. Thank you, Peter. Um, Thank you so much uh, for the opportunity. Uh, it was very interesting. Uh, in closing, I think uh, what I will put forward is that as Emalasheni local municipality, I think we should now start um, to identify all uh, the uh, just transition uh, projects. And we should also look at other economic uh, streams that can be explored uh, post uh, coal. And we should also look at um, how can the infrastructure that uh, uh, is existing now can be used uh, post coal, and what are the best energy alternatives um, are, are there for Emalakeni local municipality? Because uh, with the different uh, um, energy alternatives, is not a one size fits all. If wind is working uh, at other provinces, it doesn't mean that you to work for Emalakeni. So we should also explore at uh, what other energy alternatives will uh, suit Emanacheni. And then we should also uh, start uh, talking about uh, the skills transfer. What will happen to the people, you know, who are working in the coal uh, mining industry? Because, you know, the, and in the power stations, they've got skills um, and how will that skill be transferred into uh, uh, this uh, just transition? And the funding to do all this, where will, where will it come from? And how is this process uh, going to unfold? Is it going to be in phases? How long will it take? And I think those are the uh, uh, questions and issues that uh, as local, uh, as Emalaste local municipality, we should be starting looking at. And another thing that I think it's very key and very important is that we should be embarking now on education and awareness uh, programs to prepare you know, ordinary people and um, make them aware of this uh, uh, just transition. What is it about? So they can get you know, the necessary information. And I think it is also very important uh, that uh, our IDP is aligned uh, to all these issues that are discussed uh, today. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. Um, thank you very much, Nankalaleko. And I, I think, um, your 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 coming up a little bit with some of the concrete things. Let's identify projects, which is also what Promise has suggested, and and explore alternatives. Alex, I'm giving you the final space uh, before I close. Um, there was a, a question specifically for you around the timelines, but um, I, I, your final um, takeaways, perhaps, from this engagement, please. No, thanks, Peter. Um, thanks to everyone. Um, the question did come from Sam, um, who's unfortunately left. There are no timelines. Um, the coal mining industry is in, um, is um, is closely tied to the whole national agenda. Um, so if we build a, a mid to be in Lipalale, expanding the energy economy there, 
there is going to be a coal mine. Um, so it is not a, um, um, a unilateral decision that you can make as, as mining, but I think you know what we need to do is to work as a collective. Um, and as I had said earlier, you know, from the grassroots communities um, that are directly impacted, workers, um, 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 mining companies, government, to work together to find um, a way that can help us to transition. Um, if it were possible to do it tomorrow because of environmental challenges, so would be it. So we'd have to do that. But with 90,000 jobs at stake in the coal mining industry, most of which is supporting the energy economy, um, it would be irresponsible um, to pull the plug um, um, prematurely. So it is important that you know we um, um, we do adopt an approach that um, takes everyone on board um, and ensures that you know the solutions that we um, arrive at um, do benefit everyone um, and they don't leave anyone behind. Thanks, Peter. Uh, I Thank bet. Yes, I, I, I can't see who that is. Hello? This is who he is. It's uh, uh, hello. Unfortunately, my I when I raise my hand, it comes comes out as Melisizwe. And uh, I, I don't know why yes. and how. I'm okay. Andrew Mukini. Uh, hello, Andrew. Sorry, yes, you're showing us uh, as Melissa's way, but um, we, we, we've run out of time, but please go ahead. No, I'll just quickly say something that I, uh, I think it is important for me and important for, for the direct, directly impacted people who are, will be affected or who are affected unknowingly by this, uh, the, the just transi transition, is that uh, it looks like uh, the issues of the just, just transition and the fourth industrial revolutions are engaged by the people who are not directly affected. The people who are directly affected here are the workers. I understand, yes, the workers are invited, but they, uh, they, 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 they are in minimum. They are really at minimal, mini, minimal uh, volume in, this, in these discussions. Because I've been listening to everyone who was saying, everyone who's talking here, he doesn't say anything about, uh, 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 maybe what I'm saying, I'll be repeating what Lucky has said doesn't say anything about what will happen when we replace these with these, what will happen then with the workers? And the whatever's gonna happen with the workers, will it, will, it, will it sustain or will the people leave? Because taking away, yes, they, they, we, are, we are faced with uh, the fourth industrial revolution now going to the fifth and the, Yes, the just transition is going with that, but most of the South Africans, we are still illiterate. Though all those things are, are coming with literacy, are coming with more education that we don't have. Only limited people or only selected few will be benefiting from this. And I want to also say, the reason why the companies are, are closing now and people leaving is because they see that the, the, the just transition is putting them out. And in that, they came here, they, they, they've taken our forefathers from their areas where they will be, they've been living and created mines and made money. Now they have money and benefit. Now they are living and somebody else with just transition is coming in also to make money and also is going to live with something else coming. But the people who are suffering is us who are here. And all these things are not coming from us in our country. They are coming from somewhere else. They are not coming, from, uh, they are not originating from South Africa. I'll just say that maybe in future when I get, I uh, 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 get enough time, I will say something better. But this one, I'm just saying, I'm just giving high No, I really, really appreciate what you've said and pushing your way. Uh, so I, 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 I got you so that you spoke because I'm sorry, you came up as uh, Melissa. I think 
you are saying something really important and it's actually quite a wonderful way to, to close to today's um, event. You, 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 you said that the, 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 you, the, the affected people, the workers are here in minimum. And I, I'm also very conscious that a, a lot of the, the voices of community and workers that I know are connected to this meeting, um, their voices as participants haven't really been heard strongly. And, and I, I, I think we need to, uh, as the, the, our project, we need to consider this in the work we're doing going forward. Um, I, I also think that um, you you said that we had nobody has said what will happen, and I think Jay did respond to Lucky's comment, and he did say that we, we that the the communication and and the explanations need to be made in in a way that is clear, and I think that came up also with. Um, uh, promise and non-kololeko and and um and I and I think Alex you too and I, I feel that um we've really touched the surface today that the that that we're starting to engage together there's still a lot that needs to be explored um issues of what will happen political will communication um, and much more that has come up. And I'm very aware we're now sort of 10 minutes over time and a lot of people have left. So I really thank you for that last comment. And I, I, I think that we must create more space. And this is the first of a, a series of public events. I want to thank all the people who have contributed the, and our speakers and panelists and to the, the team here that has uh, enabled this event to happen. And as Gaylor said to UK PAC for funding it. Um, Gaylor, do you want to say a final word or should we close this uh, event and thank everyone for attending? Gaylor, do you want to? All good, all good. You okay. can close. Great. So uh, on that note, I'm going to close uh, and say thank you. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye-bye.